today. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 through 44. Uh, Jesus is talking about the ways we respond to people in certain situations and circumstances. And the ways that we respond, number one, gives us an opportunity to be a witness for Christ. Secondly, the way we respond builds a bridge with those who have offended us or maybe even hurt us. Third, this is an opportunity to show the power of the gospel in us. And as people see Christ in us, God can use us to draw others to Jesus. This is an opportunity that all of us as followers of Jesus have during these crazy times. All right, so we're going to look at Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 through 44. I'm going to read this passage. We're going to break it down. And in the end, we're going to try to answer the question, how does all of this apply to my life with where I am today? All right, let's look at Matthew chapter 5, starting with verse 38. Jesus says this, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now, Jesus He's teaching hundreds of people. They're sitting before him. Uh, Jesus' disciples were sitting around him, and they were listening to what Jesus was saying. Jesus was talking about this new kingdom that was coming and this new kingdom that we could all be a part of if we are in Christ. And so Jesus was describing this kingdom. And in this verse, in verse 38, Jesus tells them, he says, you have heard that it was said, and Jesus was speaking to a Jewish audience. And this Jewish audience, they were taught scripture from the time they were young. They understood Old Testament law. And they also understood how they should react to each other if they were offended or if they offended someone, they understood what their punishment would be. And so Jesus, he's saying that you have heard, you understand the Old Testament law. And the Old Testament law is this. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And so Jesus was pointing out to these people who were listening to him. He was telling them what they already knew. They knew that if they committed a crime, that they would suffer equal punishment. And so if someone did something wrong to someone else, then the one who did the crime would have to pay for that crime. There'd be punishment for that crime. Or if somebody did something to you, then... Uh, you would have the opportunity to either take revenge or you would have the right to make sure that the one who offended you would be punished for the wrong that they did. So this was an understanding that people in the Jewish community at that time, they understood. But here's what Jesus said. Jesus said, but I tell you, don't resist an evil doer. On the contrary, if anyone slaps you on your right cheek, Turn the other to him also, okay? Now, I know that this verse, verse 39, opens up many questions for people. There's some people that read a verse like this and they'll say, well, that's why I don't want to be a Christian. Being a Christian means that people can do violence to you and you're going to have to lay there, be a doormat, get pounded. All right, in one way, if God calls us to, to suffer like that for him, we need to be obedient. Uh, we need to suffer for him. If, if people are punishing us unjustly, right, that's part of following Jesus. We see that in the lives of many Christians in the first century is there are many who are martyred for the sake of Christ all throughout history. Over the last 2000 years of Christianity, there have been thousands and thousands of people who were unjustly murdered, unjustly put to death and who unjustly suffered for the cause of Jesus. So there are times where when we follow Jesus, we are going to be punished or we are going to suffer unjustly. But in this context, this is not exactly, or that is not exactly the point that Jesus is making, right? Here, Jesus is saying, on the contrary, if anyone slaps you on your right cheek, right? So this is not... This is not someone slapping you in, in an act of violence towards you or someone who's wanting to beat you down. This slap, right, talking about your right hand. Normally, someone who would slap you on the right cheek, it's because they're using the backside of their right hand to slap you. And when they do that, they are saying that I am better than you. 
So maybe a boss, maybe someone in authority slaps you. And so to signify their authority over you or to remind you that they are better than you, they would slap you on, with, on the backside of their right hand on your right cheek. Okay, you guys understand how that works. So this is my right hand. Uh, you get slapped on the right side of your cheek. So here, Jesus, right? Jesus says, if that happens to you, if someone hits you in a way, it's not about violence, but it is about them saying that they are better than you. Turn the other cheek. So give them your left cheek, right? Give them, give them your left cheek. Now, if you gave them your left cheek, this would create a dilemma in the other person, the one who just hit you. First of all, if you turn the other cheek, right? If you turn the other cheek, they really couldn't hit you back. They would not have the right to hit you back because they have done wrong and you are the one who deserves to hit them back. But you're not hitting them back. Instead, you are saying, hit my other cheek, right? So this is not about violence. This is really about position, right? And then if, so if you turn your other cheek, then that would mean that the one who hit you would have to hit you with with, the, with their left hand, but if they hit you with, with your left hand, they would have to hit you with the backside of their left hand, which in that culture would have meant that I'm hitting you like this because you are my equal. You are allowing, you are giving them an opportunity to hit you, but if they hit you with their left hand, they would have admitted that they are your equal, right? Do, do you see what's going on here? That someone does wrong to you, the natural response is to take revenge, but we, we see how under the strength that comes through Christ, when we are in Christ, there, there is a better way. There's a better way to deal with, with hardship, with violence, with things that are done to you in a way, first of all, that honors Jesus. Secondly, in a way that causes people to think about what they are doing. And then when we stand firm and strong in Christ, when the Holy Spirit is moving in and through us, the one who offends us will have to take a look at what's going on and they will have to wrestle with all of the hate and anger in their hearts, all the pride. And, and maybe that's an opportunity that God may be giving to the other person to deal with, with the things that are on their hearts. And so this is not about violence, right? This is not about, hey, if somebody hits you, if somebody whacks you and punches you, um, you just stand there, turn your other cheek and, and get your face smashed. And it's not about that. If somebody, if that ever happens to you, defend yourself, get, get out of there, um, you know, do, do everything that you can to be safe and to defend yourself. Okay, this is, this is, but it's not about that. This passage is not about that. This passage is about a cultural situation where someone by hitting you would say, I'm better than you. And there's just a way that you respond. And so Jesus was describing that response. And then... In verse 40, Jesus said, As for the one who wants to sue you and take away your shirt, let him have your coat as well. So in that culture, if someone, if someone sued you, right, for your shirt, it, it would usually mean that that's probably all you had, all you owned. And the one who normally would sue you is someone who had money to hire an attorney. Uh, someone could sue you because, and if it's just for your shirt, that, that meant that, that, uh, that, that someone was really wanting to take you out, right? And so whether it was fair or not, someone was wanting to sue you. And so Jesus said, if someone wants to sue you uh, for your shirt, let him have your coat as well. And so if you gave that person, your coat, right? They're suing you for your shirt. They are expecting you to fight them off. But if you say, hey, take my coat as well, that would have spoken into the person trying to sue you because it would have been unfathomable for a rich person or someone with a lot of wealth to sue someone literally for the shirt off their back and for their cloak. And so uh, again, there's a way that we, we deal with situations and circumstances and the ways that we respond. There's a way that we would normally respond. There's a way that we would respond in the flesh. There is a way that culture would respond. 
And there's a way that people expect us to respond, but the response that we see here is different. And so Jesus is talking about our hearts once again, and the restraint that we need, that the restraint that comes from him to, to honor him in these situations. And then in verse 41, it says this, and if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who asks you and don't turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Okay, so here Jesus is saying, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. All right, here, here's the significance of that. Jesus could have most likely been referring to the Roman soldiers. Right, so at this time, 2,000 years ago, Israel was under the Roman Empire. There were Roman soldiers all over the place. And when we look back in history, Roman soldiers had the right to tell people to do something for them. And so if they, they had a, a pack or if there's something that needed to be carried, a Roman soldier could point to someone, uh, any citizen, right? And say, hey, you carry that a mile. Now, the Jewish people hated the Romans. They hated Roman soldiers. They hated the Roman government. They hated the Roman taxation. They hated everything about the Romans. And so this was more than just going the extra mile. This was about the ways that the Jewish people felt about the Romans, the Roman Empire. If a Roman soldier asked them to carry something a mile, a normal person would have just done it grudgingly, right? It's like, oh, why do I have to do that? I don't want to do that. A uh, Roman soldier may have even expected some resistance. But here, Jesus, he's saying, if you're asked, by a Roman soldier to carry something for a mile, he said, go two miles. You see, the two miles, that's something unexpected. It, it would have been unexpected, right? And, and so Jesus is saying, do something that, that requires strength from within your heart. And you see, that strength comes not from our own flesh, not from our own desire or our want to, but it comes through Christ. And when Jesus changes us, there's going to be a way that we respond to situations like this. And so when they would be asked to carry something for a mile, they would take it two miles. And think about all the strength, first of all, that would have taken for any human being to carry something for a Roman soldier for a mile. That was hard. But to do it for another mile, that strength could only come from God. In fact, it would have come, it, it, it would have had to have been there for all two miles, right? All two miles. Now, the Roman soldiers, they had the right to assert that kind of authority for a mile. But what Jesus was saying, even with what you're required to do, sometimes we need to go the extra mile, all right? And so we, we see all of this. We see the way that we, we respond. We respond to people the way we respond to people who've wronged us, people we don't agree with. Here's something else that Jesus challenges us with. Verse 43 says this. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemies, right? Everyone hearing this 2,000 years ago, they would have understood that, that you love your neighbors because your neighbors love you. They're good to you. They're kind to you, but you hate your enemies because they've done wrong to you. So you hate them, right? So they, they grew up understanding that. That was part of their culture. They looked out for each other. But here's what Jesus said. But I tell you, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Think about the strength that it would take to love your enemies. We're talking agape love. Love that comes from your heart. Love that comes from within. But, but then we wrestle with our enemies. And we have to ask, why are enemies our enemies? Well, our enemies are our enemies because they've done wrong to us or we have done wrong to them. There was something that happened that caused us to be divided and it is hard for us to love our enemies and over time when we have enemies we stay divided we can't love our enemies when we think about them our blood pressure rises the hairs on the back of our neck start raising up we become tense so it's hard to love but you see the ability to love does not come from our own strength or our own power this comes from God 
This comes when we are in Christ, when Jesus saves us, we're filled with the Holy Spirit, and we no longer lean into our own strength, but we lean into Christ. We pursue Jesus. We, we surrender everything to Jesus. We recognize that we cannot do this on our own, that we need Jesus, and we need the power of the Holy Spirit to help us to love. And as we're walking with Jesus, as we're filled with the Holy Spirit, and as we grow in our relationship with God, God who is love, we're growing in this love, we're able to love even our enemies. But the strength to love does not come from ourselves. The strength to love comes through Christ. And so today, some of you are having a hard time because you have enemies and you hate your enemies. So this idea of loving your enemies is hard. Well, if that is you, if you're finding it very difficult to love your enemies today, know that you're in good company because it is hard to love our enemies on our own, in our flesh. But when we are in Christ, we turn all of that over to God. We turn that over to Jesus. We lay that thing, all, all of our hate and anger and bitterness, we lay that at the, at, at the feet of Jesus and we surrender our lives and our hearts to Jesus. And maybe today, maybe it'd be a time where you just take time to pray and say, Lord God, I, I, I hate these people. I'm mad at these people. I, and, and there's so much bitterness, but you've released that to the Lord. Will, will you do that today? Will you do that today? And as you do that, God's going to do something in you where, where now you're experiencing his love. And as you experience his love, you're going to grow in your love, even for your enemies. And then here's something radical that, that Jesus said, not only to love your enemies, but to pray for those who persecute you. Pray for them. You may be persecuted right now. It's hard to pray for those who persecute, persecute us and not retaliate. Right? When somebody persecutes me, my flesh says, I want to retaliate. I want to persecute them back. I want to point out their flaws. But we pray for them. We pray for our enemies. We love our enemies. We pray for those who persecute us. We love those who persecute us. But all of this is only possible through Jesus. So everything that we read about today in Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 through 44, all of this is not possible in our flesh. We cannot force a way to do that. But when we're walking with Jesus, as Jesus changes us, as he molds us, as we lean into the gospel, as Jesus is growing us to become more and more like him, what, what we read today becomes an outward expression of the inner reality of the work of Christ in us. So how should this apply to us? Well, let me just give you some examples of of, of how we can see this in, in our present day situation. Maybe you were driving. There's a time when you were driving and maybe you accidentally did something to cut someone else off on the freeway and you made them mad and suddenly there's road rage, not on your part, but on the one that you accidentally wronged. And, and I don't know if you've ever been in this situation, but maybe on the freeway, there's someone tailing you, speeding up, blowing their horn and just getting all crazy. And then you see them pulling out and on the freeway, driving up equally to you. And they're yelling at you and they're just cussing at you. But you know what? You know how you, you, you deflate that situation? We're lucky here in Hawaii, right? We can just say, hey, shaka, bro, I'm sorry. You know, just my bad, my bad, shaka. I don't know if you've ever been in those situations, but every single situation that I have been in like that, where I just said, hey, I'm sorry, it's my bad, it just diffuses the situation, right? It, it just, there, there's something about that, that that diffuses the situation. Or how's about this one? You're at a restaurant when a server messed up, either they messed up the, uh, your order or maybe they messed up by spilling food on you. And the natural response from other customers would be that they would get yelled at, that, that you know, they would, that, that they would just be, you'd be an angry customer. But think about those times where you didn't react with anger, where you showed love and patience. Think about what happened after that. Think about just by the grace that you showed, think about how they responded to you for the rest of the time you were at that restaurant. Or... What if you were in a strong disagreement, or maybe you've had times where you were in strong disagreement with someone, really strong, and that disagreement may have even gotten heated. But think about those times you remained calm, and you listened, and you just trusted God to do His work in you, and that, that it's, not about, it's not about escalating a situation, 
because really once you get to a place where both sides are angry and arguing, um, no one's going to listen to each other. So at that point, it's about, okay, God, how do you want me to, 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 to reflect you in this situation? And there may have been times where you just stayed calm and, and because you were calm and because you listened, and even if the other person was yelling at you, think about how that diffused a situation. We apply this in everyday life. Think about social media. Think about how quickly things can get out of hand on social media. How easy it is to respond out of anger. Uh, how easy it is re to respond because people said something to you or about you or something you don't agree with and you just fire away. I want to encourage you on social media. Number one, either not to write anything or if you're going to write something that, that you not try to defend your position, but that, that you write something to honor Jesus, right? Just honor Jesus. But I'd rather all of us, if someone says something to, that, that where they disagree with you, in fact, they may slam you, just step back, just, just breathe and pray to Jesus. Ask him to give you the strength not to respond because we don't have to respond. The reality is if you don't respond, everybody's going to forget about it by tomorrow anyway. All right. So, so don't, you don't have to respond or the way that you talk to people, maybe the way you talk to a, a server at a restaurant or some, uh, somebody at a coffee shop or, um, you know, just the way we talk to people, maybe someone might yell at us, but if we stay calm, there's a way that we honor Jesus and Jesus gives us the strength to uh, not react in a way that the world would react. Or how about this one? There may be people who don't agree with you, right? Our natural reaction is to protect our position. Uh, they said something that may be wrong um, or we may be wrong, right? We, but but we all, we're always about protecting our position. Ask God to give you the strength to at times remain silent and, and, and just have the strength just to, um, you know, just to get through that situation or circumstance. Because the reality is this, chances are in the midst of all of this, it's not going to solve the world's problem. Like you getting that one issue right with that one person and you arguing, it's not going to resolve anything. In fact, just you trying to argue over that is just going to escalate a situation. So this is where we ask Jesus to help us, to give us the strength to reflect him and to be strong and, and uh, you know, just, just keep the doors open for people's hearts to look toward Jesus. I'm going to leave you this one verse and we'll be done. James 1, 19 says this, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak and slow to anger, right? Let that be our challenge for the rest of the week. Hope you guys have a great week and I am so looking forward to seeing all of you very, very soon. Have a great day.